Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm James Heinz. Um, I'm the chair of the membership committee of IAPI, the International Association for Feminist uh, Economics. And welcome to our first online webinar, Feminist Economic Perspectives on COVID-19. Uh, I just want to let you know that this is a, the first in a series of uh, COVID-related and other feminist economics-related events that IAPI is planning uh, to um, have in the next uh, several weeks, several months um, as uh, this crisis proceeds. Um, I just want to start with a few uh, preliminaries. One is just to let everyone know that this uh, webinar is being recorded, um, and that's to make it available to people who can't join us uh, right now, so just uh, so that you know that. Uh, second is that we've um, put on a number of security settings, um, and this is because there's there's stories of hackers uh, infiltrating events like this, you know, to disrupt them um, and just uh, cause problems. So just so you know, as G said, you're all going to be on mute. Um, when, uh, when we get to the discussion, you'll be able to raise your hand or send her a, a, a message um, to unmute yourself, um, and then you can, can make a comment or ask a question. Um, also, the chats, the ch all the chats are just going to go to Jihi, um, who you just uh, just met. Um, and so uh, if, if you want to send her a message um, as, as well, uh, do that. But it's not going to go to the, the entire group. And Ji is also uh, in control of the screen. So she's the only one that can share their screens. So those are the security settings that we put in place uh, just to make sure that we uh, protect ourselves from a potential uh, person or a hacker who's going to uh, disrupt uh, uh, this. Um, I have one more announcement, which is the journal Feminist Economics um, has just uh, released a call for papers uh, looking at the COVID crisis. These are shorter papers, around 5,000 words each, um, with a uh, uh, deadline for the papers is at the end of May. You can look for um, uh, more details about uh, the special issue of the journal Feminist Economics focusing on COVID at the IAFE website. So that's IAFFE.org. Okay, so we're going to start with, with the, seven, uh, the webinar. Uh, the structure is that we have three panelists. Uh, they each have 10 minutes. And so we're going to begin the webinar with 10 minute presentations from each of our panelists. Um, and the panelists um, in the order that they're going to present are Nancy Fulbright from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Nyla Kabir from the London School of Economics, and Janine Anderson from the Catholic uh, University of Peru. Um, they're going to uh, speak for 10 minutes each, so for the first 30 minutes or so will be the panel presentations. Then we're going to open it up uh, for uh, comments, questions, hearing from, from you. And I'll say a little bit more how that's going to run after the, the presentations are over. Uh, but with that, um, let's begin with our first panelist, uh, Nancy. Do we have the slides? Yes, the slides are shared. There we go. Okay. Hello, friends. I'm, I'm really happy to participate in this international discussion. Here you have a picture of me in my bandit ninja outfit. Um, <clears throat> homemade, uh, unpaid work, um, kind of a, um, a symbol of the efforts that we're all making to deal with uh, a very difficult crisis with very imperfect means at our disposal. Next slide. So first point, women are the majority of the paid and unpaid care workforce. I think that's true on a global level. Um, I, a lot of my comments are, are US centric because that's the uh, environment that I'm operating in. Uh, but I think it's generally true that women are concentrated in uh, uh, the work of caring for others in both paid work. And we also know from time use surveys that they're typically doing the bulk of the uh, unpaid care. This has really huge implications for not just for the health impact, but also for the economic impact of the uh, pandemic, because the pattern that we're seeing is that some care workers are being overworked involuntarily, um, put under a lot of stress, 
and some are uh, finding themselves unemployed and uh, unable to pay their bills. Um, I think the pattern, uh, economic uh, pattern of impact is changing pretty quickly. Initially in the US, it looked like um, more women were gonna experience um, extreme levels of unemployment than men because of their industrial concentration. But as the economic impact of the virus kind of uh, rolls along, uh, it, it seems that the impact will be wider and it's, it's not really clear at this point what the gender impact will be. So for a good overview of, a, of the um, kind of economic impact in the US, I wanna refer you to this paper by Alan et al, the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality. I think it's a little over optimistic and in that uh, maybe a little bit out of date, but uh, it, it, it still has kind of some useful um, uh, specifics about uh, sectoral impact. Another really interesting thing about the pandemic, in my opinion, is that it's altering the way we define who a care worker is. And I don't think it can be restricted to people working in health education and, and social services because so many other workers have ended up in, in um, vulnerable jobs uh, vulnerable and essential jobs. And I, I just want to send you to my, uh, my blog post on the evolving definition of the care worker here, if you want to kind of weigh in on that. Um, I do think this really needs to be an international discussion. Next slide. So just to summarize, care workers in general are undervalued, they're underpaid, and they're underprotected. And uh, it's great that we're cheering them on um, in most places um, at 7 p.m. every evening, but I, I don't think that's really enough to, um, that's not really an adequate response. And um, so we need, to, we need to really call attention to and really emphasize the particular vulnerability that uh, essential workers and care workers uh, are, are, are dealing with on a, a, a global level. Um, we also need to keep thinking about why, um, why they're undervalued, why they're underpaid, why they're underprotected. And some of that, some of the reasons for that I think are familiar ones. They, in general, women have less bargaining power than men. Uh, and a lot of, of care workers are also disadvantaged in terms of their race, ethnicity, um, citizenship, class, uh, and so on. So the you know, overall impact is, is very uneven. Uh, for a really nice um, kind of short comment on the political implications, I think Paul Krugman's op-ed piece in the New York Times that I've linked to here um, is a very nice little polemic, billions for oil, nothing for nurses and teachers. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty casual analysis, and I think one of the things that feminist economists could be doing is looking in more detail at the budget implications uh, for women and for care workers in the specific uh, recovery packages that are being um, uh, put in place uh, around the world. Uh, and I outlined some of my thoughts about a care theory of value in, in a blog post that's, that's linked to here. Okay, next slide. So what do we know about the impact on total consumption, um, including consumption of care? Well, uh, we know, so this is obvious, unemployment has gone up, income has gone down. It's also true that unpaid work within households has gone way up, but in some ways, unpaid work networks have been handicapped by the virus because of the reduction of between household assistance, like grandparents providing childcare. So we know that we're seeing a big increase in inequality and precarity, and it's not just about uh, inequality and precarity of money income, it's also about some people lacking access to, to family, to friends, to homes in which to sequester. And I think there's a real, really um, pressing need for uh, some kind of quick web-based uh, survey of time use and resource sharing in sequestered households. Uh, kind of to move beyond the metric of money income and, and measure GDP. And so I've been trying to coordinate with other time use researchers about this. 
and I've actually heard from people all over the world, Canada, um, um, Peru, Chile, uh, and I think there's going to be uh, uh, some interesting new data emerging from the uh, from some of these surveys. Next slide, last slide. So there's been a lot of talk about health versus jobs, health versus profits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think in the short run, in the U.S. at least, um, it's not really a short run trade off. We can't uh, we can't really address the unemployment and job situation without prioritizing health. Uh, but in the long run, I think there are some trade-offs here that we need to face up to. And the, the trade-offs, I think, are going to be especially great or are already especially great in, in uh, the global south. And uh, this is something that I think economists um, maybe have some little bit of comparative advantage in, in thinking about, uh, but they often think about it in the wrong ways. So I'm hoping that feminist economists can really enter this debate um, about these trade-offs in a in a in a in a really um, in a really proactive way. Um, obviously, the impact th these trade-offs are going to vary from country to country and situation to situation. But I think that's a reason that um, it's really important for us all to really support multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization, like the United Nations, like the International Labor Organization. And uh, that's that's kind of where I want to end my my presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Nancy. And uh, totally within the ten minute uh, uh, time cap. Um, and so our our next uh, presenter on the, the panel is Nyla Kabir. Nyla. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so could we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So what I'm I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be focusing on the idea of livelihoods to make my comments. And by livelihoods, I mean the range of paid and unpaid activities through which people look after themselves, their family, and they plan for the future. And I've chosen images mainly to make my points. Um, in this slide, I've just sort of summarized some of the points that people have made. That this is a crisis that we are experiencing across the world in very similar ways and in around the same time. But we are not in this together. And crises often have a revelatory function. And this one has served to shine a light on very stark inequalities that some of us may not have known existed or had chosen not to know existed. And uh, I want to be using some of the vocabulary. Each crisis has its own vocabulary. And I want to use a vocabulary that's been used to classify workers in order to draw attention to uh, some of these inequalities. And then to go back a bit to what we should have learned from the crises of the past. And our failure to learn is one of the reasons that we're paying a heavy price right now. So a slide three, the next one, is a, a GIF. And Jihi, could you just use the, yes. So this is a GIF of a figure that is in all our thoughts right now. Uh, the heroic health worker in the front line of the battle with the virus, exhausted with all that she's been through, resting for a moment, then putting on her mask, and preparing to return to battle against the virus. So she's a very heroic figure. And along with other health workers, she's been described as an essential worker who's expected to work right through the pandemic. But that there is a hierarchy of these essential workers, even within the health service, becomes very obvious to us when we hear someone like the UK Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, who spoke at a recent press conference and said that um, around four doctors have died so far, and some nurses. And he was asked how many nurses, and he didn't know. So one way in which the hierarchy is being manifested is by whose depth count. At the moment, we have a better idea of how many nurses are dying, but we don't know how many people in healthcare homes, the patients as well as the carers, are dying. That, that data is not being collected. Uh, the next slide, please. The NHS has been systematically starved uh, over resources as a result of austerity. Uh, as a result, a lot of medical staff are doing without proper equipment. We don't know if there's a gender uh, dis discrimination in the way that this equipment is being distributed, but this slide is of three nurses who are making the point about shortages. They are being forced to wear bin liners in their fight against the, in, in, in the hospitals, and all three have now uh, tested positive for the virus. 
gender intersects. Obviously, these are women, and women are very prominent in the health, in the health sector, but it does intersect with ethnicity and migrant status. The first four doctors who died, the ones that Matt Hancock was talking about, were all Muslim, all migrants, and all men. Wow. They came from uh, Middle East and Africa. Since then, we know a disproportionate number of deaths amongst health workers are from the Black and minority ethnic groups. That's not a question of these people being somehow more genetically predisposed to dying of the virus, but it's the fact that how disproportionate, they are a very high proportion of them are working in the health service, and also about where they are positioned in the medical hierarchy. Are they on the front line, or are they in more senior positions, and therefore more distant from contact? And if, obviously gender plays a role here. We know that UK and globally, almost three in every four essential frontline workers from medical personnel to medical laundry workers are women, and almost all administrators tend to be men. The next slide, please. This is an image of another essential worker. Um, this time it's a photograph from India of a policeman somewhere in India eating his solitary meal while on duty. And juxtaposed with it is a photograph by an unknown artist of the policeman as he might have been if he had been eating at home rather than on duty. And we have the shadowy outlines of his wife, lovely, preparing his meal, his daughter, and a goat tethered nearby. A number of thoughts come to my mind when I looked at this picture. One, of course, is we're looking at the idealized nuclear family, male breadwinner, the wife, and the child. But regardless of how idealized the picture is, the point that Nancy made, the shadowy picture of the wife stands for literally millions of women, largely invisible, whose daily labor, cooking meals with the family, is essential to the health, labor, and well-being of the policeman, but whose work is not even counted as work, never mind being counted as essential work. Another thought, what happens when men who are classified as non-essential workers and therefore subject to the lockdown have to stay at home? Does the gender division of domestic labor change? Do men and boys take on a greater share of the work or do concerns with masculinity get in the way? I don't know what the evidence is on this and maybe Nancy will be able to tell us with that time allocation. But if men are not prepared to take on a fairer share, then the amount of work that women have, has to, have to do will be disproportionate. And we gather this from some rapid monitoring work that WIGO has been doing, which suggests that live-in domestic workers who've been kept on by affluent families in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, have seen their workloads increase exponentially because now they are cooking all the meals all the time for families who stay at home all day and must take extra precautions about hygiene. And one final thought about this picture is, of course, the depiction of peace and harmony that we see in it is not necessarily happening across the world. We have seen reports of an increase in domestic violence during the lockdown period, starting in China and spreading to other countries. And it's far too widespread to be not linked to the pandemic. It may be that the withdrawal of the exit option for women and children, children emboldens greater violence on the part of, of men who were already abusive. It may be the sheer stress of having to be in the same confined space day in and day out is more telling on the tempers of people who have greater freedom, freedom of movement as a part of their daily lives. Or it may be the precarity of livelihoods and frustration of men unable to provide for their families leads them to lash out at those who are less powerful than them or those that they feel they are letting down. While reliable cash transfers might help in the latter case, we also need to tackle this frightening extent to which male identity is often bound up with male breadwinning capacity. Next slide, please. This is a painting of uh, those who are officially classified as non-essential workers who have to observe the lockdown because they're not, their work is not, they can do their work at home and their work is not considered essential. This painting is a very stark uh, depiction of the divide between the haves and the have-nots. Those with comfortable homes, with toilets and incomes, and those in low-income crowded households. Now, a version of this divide is present in every country, but it is particularly stark in this case, because we're not just talking about people in crowded homes, we are people who have to talk, who have to walk several hundred miles to get to their home. These are the non-essential, usually invisible workers, but suddenly visible of the informal economy. Migrants who travel from different to different parts of India to clean your offices and homes, work in construction, transport, fields and farms. They work without contracts, uh, they're paid by the day and they live a hand-to-mouth existence. And they are drawn from the poorest states 
of India for the most marginalized of social groups, the untouchable castes and the indigenous groups. And uh, they work in the informal economy. And while more men work in the informal economy than women, a disproportionate percentage of women, uh, of women, working women, are in the informal economy. So what has drawn attention to this particular picture is, is the sheer exodus involved. Half a million people walking for several, you know, several hundred miles to get home. And because no public and private transport is allowed, and because of the way in which the lockdown was announced, just giving people four hours to find themselves a home to get into. And of course, what you saw was pandemonium. Arundhati Roy quotes a carpenter who said, who was trying to walk from Delhi to Nepal, to the border near Nepal, saying, maybe the prime minister, when he decided to do this, nobody told him about us. Maybe he doesn't know about us. And the us he is talking about is approximately 460 million people. There's no way he could not have known about them. Next slide. Um, is what I want to focus on now is what we could have learned from past crisis. Can I have the next slide? Yes, yeah, sorry, just one second. So when structural adjustment programs were rolled out across Africa and Latin America in the 1980s, the vocabulary of vulnerability entered the development discourse. It signaled the fact that it was not only the poor who became poorer during this crisis, but also middle class men and women whose jobs in the formal sector were being entrenched. The language of vulnerability rather than poverty seemed to hold up the promise of cross class solidarity in developing social protection schemes for the future, but what we got were residual means tests and safety nets. The East Asian crisis, in turn, revealed the inadequacy of the familiar safety nets that the region had relied on and the importance of ex-ante institutionalized measures that could be scaled up to meet the challenges of crisis, rather than government scrabbling to put something into place after the fact. Some of the regions, some of the countries in the region have learned this lesson. And then we got the global uh, financial crisis, which gave us a challenge, challenged us with two ways of managing. Economic stimulus, packages to generate jobs and grow out of crisis, or austerity to cut back on public expenditure, run down the welfare state and allow the public private sector to generate growth. We in the UK opted for austerity. We bailed out the banks, we blamed, we blamed the greedy public sector for the debt, we cut back on the National Health Service, and we froze the pay of public sector workers. There are video clips circulating from 2017 of some of the Tories who cheered when an increase in nurses' pay was voted down. Okay, two minutes? Two minutes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, among those who voted against that increase were Boris Johnson, Matt Hancock and Preeti Patel, who is current Home Secretary, who just before the virus declared that any worker earning less than 25,000 a year should be classified as a low-skilled worker. Two of these low-skilled workers, both migrants, have just been thanked by Boris Johnson for saving his life. So the results of austerity have been the erosion of public services, and now, with the coronavirus posing such a challenge, we are reaping the whirlwind in the form of nurses wearing bin liners for protection. So the crisis has revealed in a way that no other what essential work really means. And a great deal of that work is the caring and reproductive work done by women, mainly women in the paid and unpaid economy. This is not the last pandemic, the factors that gave rise to this one, the industrialization of food production and the ever increasing encroachment on natural habitat means that there will be others inevitably. And it seems to be obvious that, to many of us that we need to nationalize essential services services and universalize access to them as the foundation of a resilient economy, one that prospers in normal times and can withstand some of the worst ravages of crisis. For me then the challenge is whether there is a popular and political will for the redistribution of income and wealth that will be necessary for such a nationalization to take place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nyla. Uh, a, a tour de force in a way, touching on so many issues. So we're going, <laughs> turn to our final uh, panelist, uh, uh, Janine Anderson uh, from uh, the Catholic University of Peru. Over to you, Janine. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, next slide, please. In, I think that the uh, great unknown at this moment in the advance of coronavirus over the planet is what is going to happen with developing countries. So that is going to be my focus. Obviously, I live in one of those 
countries of the global south, although not one of the most disadvantaged. And I want to explore some of the reasons why it may be that Peru is in a, a relatively favorable position to be meeting this challenge. In, I, I've listed some of the elements that that, that are, are obviously of concern when we think about developing countries and, and you know, what their destiny may be you know, in the current moment. And I don't think that I need to go into these issues with the audience that we have here today. I guess I would like to you know, just you know, emphasize how suddenly the, the idea of last in line for supplies and equipment and even health carers, healthcare workers has become such a burning issue. Uh, I, we're almost at a point where we're ranking developing countries now in terms of how many ventilators do they have. So we hear reports that some African countries may have seven or eight to the entire health system. Peru has 500 ventilators for a population of 32 million and about 700 doctors trained to work in intensive care. In the next slide, please. So I mentioned how important the particular moment seems to be in the histories or the, the local you, you, you processes ongoing in different countries of the developing world. And I, I, uh, when I think of Peru and its position at this moment, uh, you know, I, uh, for one you, advantage that we have, we're coming off a period of accumulation of reserves. We have a relatively stable and competent government with a non-ideological leadership that is not facing elections, not undergoing other crises at the moment, and so very laser focused on dealing with the health issue and, and trying to salvage what it can of the economy. And several social programs are in place. Conditional cash transfers, very, a very you know, prevalent type of program used by Latin American governments, non-contributory pensions, support for micro enterprise, et cetera. And you know, that is, backed up by a roster of households in poverty and extreme poverty with uh, uh, a mass of local facilitators and monitors already in the field. And the beneficiaries of these social programs are largely connected to the banking system and the, especially of cash transfer, transfers, are made primarily to women under the argument that women will be better, make better use of the cash that the household receives and also that they will be more responsible in terms of meeting the conditions that are required, taking children for health checkups and making sure that they're enrolled in school. This, I, 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 I try to imagine what our situation might have been if the pandemic would have reached us a year ago when we were in a full constitutional crisis with parliament fighting with the Supreme Court, fighting with the executive, or if it had been a year of you know, the floods and natural disasters associated with El Nino. So I think that this is something that you know, we hear now of invasions of locusts and the Horn of Africa and other local or regional occurrences that have to do with this or speak to this issue of what, what was the particular moment when the pandemic arrived in full force. Next slide, please. So this, I think, can never be forgotten when we look at developing countries. These are scenario, countries where endemic and epidemic diseases are present, have not been eliminated or even brought under control. Dengue fever, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, diseases that are not a mystery, but have not been eliminated from the scene by any means. You, 
And an important precedent in this connection for Peru is the cholera epidemic. And Peru is the, its point of entry to Latin America in 1991. But at that time, Peru had, because it was in the throes of a, a crisis of poverty and economic uh, downturn, uh, the, there were the poor neighborhoods and poor communities throughout the country had a very active presence of women grouped in health promoter committees or in soup kitchens and mother's clubs. And they were, as all analyses suggest, key to you know, dealing with the cholera epidemic as, you know, in, in, as in a rather successful, or what has been judged to be a pretty successful response at the time because poverty levels have receded since then. And these were seen to be, you know, this was social infrastructure that was very you know, you know, linked to anti-poverty programs at the time. In this infrastructure has been dismantled. And now we are left with the social programs and the cadres of government workers that are out in the field working with computerized rosters of, you know, of you know, households you know, in need and you know, the criteria that are used to draw those rosters. Next, please. Next. So Peru at day 31 of the COVID-19 lockdown, distancing, has proved to be almost impossible. And this, I think, is the, these are the scenes that we're seeing on international news media of the open markets in all of the countries of the South. And the crowding on public transportation and the crowding to get the daily necessities. Janine, are you there? Um, she's here, but I think we've just lost her audio. Hold on uh, for one minute while we try to figure out what's going on. She should be back in just a moment. Janine, I see your audio is reconnected. Hi, Jane. Yeah, hello again. Hello. There we go. So sorry for that. I'm, I'm the, the, my internet is a bit unstable today. So to, um, um, we lost you right around um, this slide. So if you just want to pick up. Okay. Yeah, just so you know. Okay. So here we are, day 31 of the COVID-19 lockdown. And social distancing, this is such a, a major issue for all developing countries where people are used to buying food on a daily basis in open markets, transportation systems are crowded and overloaded and, and in general, crowding in, within how, households is, it tends to be notable too. And curiously, one of the uh, advisors to the Peruvian commando group that's in charge of the response to the coronavirus pandemic uh, suggested alternate days for the circulation of men and women as a solution to you know, bringing the density down at the market. So this would have meant that the men would be doing the daily purchasing on their day for going out. And this was shown to be impracticable. It was, you know, no, it, it was just simply uh, not obeyed by the population. And the consultant that had this idea said that he had been defeated by the customs of patriarchy, which was still prevalent in the, in the country, and which meant that women were in charge of provisioning and the daily food preparation. Uh, 
Well, subsidies and income reports are gradually moving into the bank accounts of the persons that are you know, in the official rosters. You know, a recently published you know, survey suggests that about a third of households have had no income since a month ago when the you know, quarantine was imposed. And about a third of the population is getting the government subsidies, the subsidies but that is, those two thirds are not necessarily you know, absolutely congruent. 70% of Peru's workers are informal. You know, some of the supports are going to so-called independent workers, but they're very hard to find, very hard to identify, and they are not. You, you, no, universally listed on any kind of government inventory, much less with associated bank accounts. Finally, the large sector of household workers, and this is cooks and cleaners and nannies and caretakers, at-home caretakers, have largely been left to the mercies of their employers. So we don't really know where they are sheltering, whether at the job or with their own families and households, whether they still have jobs, whether they still have, have incomes. So next slide. And to leave us with some of the, the, the problems areas that I see that are becoming so clear. And I think that this, this you no know, idea of exposing the limits of the capacity to care and to care about is one of the major themes that we're dealing with. So despite Peru's self-image as a society where caretaking it follows the lines of family and kinship and affinity and friendship, I think that we are coming to see very clearly under this crisis how much caretaking, caretaking actually occurs under conditions of contract, maybe verbal contracts such as a household worker might have, and payment. But these are relationships that are shot through with gender and ethnic and racial and class hierarchies such as Naila already talked about. This includes the health system, which is extremely So the lower ranks of the health system where nurses and nurses aides and technicians are concentrated. This is where not only women are concentrated, but women that come from social class origins that may be you, 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 the inferior, and women that are undervalued in the professions and the, 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 the work they're doing and undervalued and subordinated as persons. So how does compassion thrive in an environment of subordination and fear of sanctions and job loss? I think there was a, 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 an opinion piece in the New York Times you, a couple of weeks ago, questioning which will we run out of first, health workers or compassion? You, next, Peru's government and community response to the pandemic has given little or no attention to the Venezuelan immigrants and refugees in our midst, who are 800,000, most of them informal workers trying to get a foothold in the economy, not documented, not certified, many of them even health professionals that cannot be incorporated under present circumstances in the Peruvian effort to meet the pandemic. Um, but I think that this too suggests how the issues of caring for and caring about strangers and a certain, in a, in a sense, the entire global south or the poor of the of the of the planet are the strangers for the countries of the north which definitely may be facing their own dramas and tragedies but you know, maybe you know, not you know, to be compared to what may be in store we don't know yet what may be in store for these strangers that are in the the global south. So that is the, I guess, somewhat pessimistic note that I would like to end on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine, and thanks to um, all the, the panelists.
So what we're going to do now is we're going to move to kind of the question answer discussion portion of, of the webinar. How this is going to operate is you can uh, raise your hand by uh, going down to the participants uh, uh, link um, and just raise your hand. Uh, if, if, if you have a problem doing that, just uh, send a chat message to G. So G is going to moderate, she, she's uh, going to call on you. She's going to keep track of whose hands are raised uh, or who sent her um, a message uh, who, who wants to speak. I'm going to ask you to keep your questions short. We want to hear from as many people as possible, but we have 425 people on this webinar right now. Um, and so there's a large number of you out there. So also apologies in advance if we can't get to, to, to everyone. What we're going to do is maybe take uh, about three questions or comments, and if it makes sense, we'll come back to the panelists uh, to get some, some, some responses, some additional uh, thoughts, and we'll see how that goes. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask GE um, to uh, you know, uh, start identifying people who want to ask questions and make comments. She'll unmute you, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So GE. Yes, thank you, James. So if everyone could just stand by, I'm gonna call your name um, and then I will unmute you. So our first question is from Bharati uh, Sadasivam. Just one second, I'm gonna unmute you, Bharati. And thank you. you should be able to ask. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jean, is it, who, uh, who's coordinating. And thank you, James, and all, all of you uh, for this uh, excellent webinar. My name is Bharati Sadashivam. I am the Regional Gender Equality Advisor for UNDP, based in the Istanbul Regional Hub. And it's a really interesting and very rewarding to listen to these real issues that you are all flagging, both from your experience and your work. Uh, my question is as follows. We are trying to work and support our country offices and, our gov and, and the governments in the region. And we, we work in Eastern Europe which includes the Balkans, uh, the Caucasus, and Central Asia countries. And uh, one of the big invisible issues is, as you probably know, is the question of care. Uh, all aspects of care, both in the health system, but also at home, and the, the whole issue of unpaid care work. So my question to you is, if you can, from your perspective, both as practitioners and experts, give us a, a few practical suggestions that we could offer governments in terms of how they can address the care issue in this time of crisis, both in the immediate suppression phase and in the immediate uh, post-suppression recovery phase. As you know, the care, the care economy is not something that um, governments invest in readily. They do see it as spending and not investment, despite lots of research and evidence to the contrary. So at this point, it's particularly difficult to persuade governments to, uh, to invest in this issue, even though it's a hugely critical. So any practical suggestions from you would be very helpful. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bharati. Um, so G, back to you. Great, so I'm gonna take two more questions before we get some responses. The next question will be from Shraddha Jane. I'm just unmuting you. Go ahead, Shraddha. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, organizers for having uh, this wonderful session. My question uh, arises from Professor Anderson's discussion on uh, how women were involved in community uh, health provisions. And this uh, uh, draws me towards the role of ASHA workers in India, that's uh, accredited social health workers. So I would like to know from the panelists how they see the burden of community health, especially ASHA workers and Anganwadi workers, which are, who are part of integrated child development scheme in the current situation. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a PhD scholar at Center for Development Studies, India. Thank you. Thank you so much. So G, one more question or comment. Yes, great. So our next uh, question will come from Luisa Nassif Perez. Just one second, Luisa. You can go ahead. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's uh, well very hard to have one question here, but uh, I I would like to to think a little bit on where we can act. I think at this point, this is extremely important. Uh, and it's very clear by now that at a national level, we're seeing this perverse correlation between poverty and race and mortality rates, hospitalization rates and so on. Uh, and it seems that the way uh, two things are playing a role here on making the crisis worse within the national level, a socioeconomic structure, neoliberal agenda has left us extremely unprepared and also misgovernance or mismanaging of the crisis. And this is, uh, this is really the case for places like the US and Brazil, where I'm from. And what I want to know is, do you think there, there is a need for uh, a global uh, responsibility of places like US and Brazil that are food exporters and that if they end up mismanaging this so badly uh, that you have a problem within borders that actually ends up being a problem for the rest of the world. And what is our role in trying to understand what is the global responsibility that certain countries have right now and not let just people mismanage uh, the situation this way? Thank you. Great, uh, thanks so much. Uh, so uh, why don't we begin um, with, with Nancy. I'm going to go back to the, the, the panelists um, and just uh, respond to what uh, questions uh, you feel that you don't have to feel like you have to respond to every single question, just the ones that you uh, uh, have something to say. So, uh, let's go to Nancy Bulger. Uh, let me respond to Bharati's question because that touches very directly on, on my area of interest. I think the most important step at this point is to develop an, a survey and inventory of um, the uh, services that households and individuals need. And really looking, really trying to identify who are the individuals who are alone? Who are the individuals who don't have a home? Who are the individuals that don't have a friend or family member that can help them uh, through the crisis? And ideally, um, in my view, um, multilateral agencies should be taking the lead in developing some kind of standardized instrument that, that, that could, be, um, could be used uh, in a variety of different contexts. I know that Oxfam right now is working on a, a kind of survey design, but there needs to be much more uh, consolidated effort to, to, to kind of figure out where the, uh, where the bottlenecks and shortages and holes in uh, kind of family and community care are. Uh, and I think that's something that really everybody listening here could, could contribute to. Great, thanks, Nancy. Uh, Nyla. Are you there, Nyla? Oh, just one second. She seems to be muted. One second. Nyla, you're muted, so we're going to unmute you now. Okay, all right. And now you're go. unmuted. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick up the, the, the question about frontline care workers because I think uh, it, it's taking very many different forms in different countries. Uh, but I think, you know, this is the moment, if you like, the political moment for us to, in a sense, have a global movement about uh, recognizing the value and investing more resources in enabling these people to do the work they do. A lot of it is almost voluntary, you know, and I think the Anganwari workers, etc., they get paid a pittance. And yet, at the moment, a lot of them are being expected to take on quite difficult and uh, risky jobs. So I, I think it's about professionalizing that care work and stopping treating it as something that people do, maybe out of compassion and so on. You know, compassion is fine, but uh, incentives also help. And I would like to see if this is, you know, this is the moment where this kind of work needs to be recognized. So I think there is a real case for political advocacy in different countries, because it's not just India, it's, yeah. you know, it's across the world. Great, thanks so much. Um, and so, um, Janine, there was a, a specific question on women in community health, uh, in these community health uh, uh, centers and so on, um, and your experience with that and maybe elaborating on that. Um, uh, but whatever else you want to, to, to respond to, uh, that'd be great. So over to you, Janine. No, I, I'm very grateful that, for that question because I think it's a, a very important issue. Now, certainly in the cholera epidemic, 
it, it was the community women organized in these little health promoter and soup kitchen groups that were identifying which of their neighbors were at risk, which of them were isolated, they were distributing rehydration salts, they were doing all kinds of things that today might have to change radically in character because a lot of the, them were very much, they very much contradicted a, a, an idea of social distancing. But still, no, they, having people on the ground that are watching the processes and know the families in a neighborhood versus the figure that we have today in Peru of these you know, large government programs that depend on you know, registering with the municipal authority and proving by the criteria that have been established that you are eligible for the social programs. You know, and then having you know, you know, non-members of the community that are out there doing the monitoring and making sure that people that are in the conditional cash transfer program, for example, are actually going to the health services in the schools. I mean, that to me is a very stark contrast between two different almost philosophies of how it is you meet the needs, how you, how you even understand and measure the needs of, of local communities. And a lot of the people that may be very needy, but that are fearful of government and, you know, or simply out of, the, out of the reach of the government. So that somehow it seems to me that we're trying to find a combination of those two kinds of strategies. Yeah where the, the, the promotional, the generous and, and caring uh, benefits of the community women who are trying to get more and more of their neighbors to get more and more benefits could somehow cancel out what often tends to be the, the, uh, the ethos within the government programs, which is avoiding fraud, making sure that nobody gets benefits that didn't really meet all the criteria or didn't uh, comply with the conditions. So that's the dilemma. I, I, Peru has gone uh, too far in dismantling what this, the, the groups that once existed. I hope that other countries will avoid that. Great, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to draw attention to, to Louisa's question as well. You know, one of the initial responses to COVID has been, you know, a kind of a, a very re a retreat from globalization, a retreat from global responsibilities where borders have been closed, people have turned inwards, um, and um, they focused on protecting their own citizens. But it does raise this, a bunch of issues around global cooperation, global responses, and global uh, responsibilities. And Nancy had, uh, I had also wanted to say something uh, in response to Louisa's question. So I'm going to turn to Nancy. I just wanted to say that I think we do, affluent countries do have a global responsibility. I'm not optimistic about the US uh, fulfilling that responsibility in any way, shape, or form in the next few months. But one of our tasks here in this country is to try to change that. Great, thanks so much. And so uh, G has three, uh, three more questions. So uh, back to you, G. Yes, thank you. I see some people have their hands raised, but I'm also getting a lot of questions by chat. So the next three will come from chat. Uh, first, it will be from Kimberly Christensen. Just one second, Kimberly. Okay. You can go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Kim Christensen. I teach at Sarah Lawrence College right outside of New York City. Um, I teach labor and economics. And um, this is a very personal conversation for me. Two of my students have mothers who are nurses um, who are ill, uh, one of whom is very ill. Uh, so this is really hitting home for me. Um, Elizabeth Warren and Ro Khanna have introduced something called the Essential Workers Bill of Rights um, into the US Senate which includes, among other things, uh, mandatory personal protection equipment, premium pay for all frontline healthcare workers, uh, protection for collective bargaining, which is kind of amazing in, a, in this bill, uh, paid sick leave and family leave, and healthcare security for anyone involved in the epidemic. Um, there's a lot of other things, but those are some of the essentials. 
Um, and I wondered what the panelists think about, first of all, this is kind of a model, what's good about it, what's maybe deficient about it as a model for protecting frontline care workers. And can we summon the political will to get this passed both in the US and in other countries where this will unfortunately become increasingly relevant? Thank you. Great, thank you. G, next question. Thank you. The next one will be from uh, Anna Tribin. You can go ahead, Anna. Hi, how are you? Ah, oh, sorry. Hi, how are you? Good. I we can hear you. Sorry? We can hear you. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> so I have a question for Janine. Gender restrictions in going out has been implemented in Colombia. The mayor thinks that it is a easy way to con we lost her. Anna, we lost your audio. Can you hear me? We lost. Yes. Oh, now you're back. Okay, continue. Thank you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, one more okay? try, Anna. If not, yes. If, please go okay. ahead. So, one of the questions is to Janine. Uh, gender restrictions in going out to the street has been implemented in Colombia. The mayor thinks that is an easy way to control who is out in the street. But why do you think it didn't work in Peru? Which are the consequences of having this difference between gender in going out? I have been reading in Twitter that uh, the days for men, uh, the probability of get rough is higher but I want to hear your opinion. And to Nancy, I wanted to ask you if you think that the young middle income women are more vulnerable. I was thinking about this because, for example, in Colombia, subsidies are targeting the poor, poorest population, but the middle income women with young kids are very vulnerable. So I want to, to know what do you think about this? Great, thanks, Anna. Okay, Jihee, one more. Yes, the next question will be from Erica um, Aloe. Erica, one second, you can go ahead. Hello, I'm Erica Aloe, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Rome, Sapienza. And currently, I live in the US, in Washington, DC. Um, I would like to thank uh, the panelists for the very interesting uh, comments they shared with us. And uh, uh, my question is linked to something that uh, Nancy mentioned, the urgency of collecting time use data. Uh, I worked on time use data for my PhD thesis and I analyzed time use data about Italy. And uh, we know that um, women um, devolve around 70% of their time to unpaid care and domestic work. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the amount of time that they devote to work in total, including paid and unpaid work, is higher than the amount of work that men perform. So I'm, I'm really interested to know what is happening now in the time of the lockdown. But I know, for example, that Italy is not going to collect time use data this year. And uh, therefore, with a colleague from Thailand, we would like to try in a smaller scale, of course, to collect information on time use in the current times. So my question is, that is um, do you have some suggestion on uh, some issues that we should focus on or methodologies that uh, we could use? Great, thank you so much. Um, and so I'm going to begin um, by asking Janine to respond to the question or elaborate on the issue of why kind of the, the gender segregation of going out, you know, men go out on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and women on uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, why that didn't work in Peru um, since it's being attempted in other countries such as Colombia. Yeah. 
Those were exactly our days. And on I Sunday, know, I, I, nobody I went out. I was stranded <laughs> in, in Peru during the quarantine for about three weeks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this scheme lasted about four days in Peru from the time it was announced until the time it was withdrawn. And I think that it, there was quite a bit of cowardice on the part of the government that they just weren't willing to go out on a limb and you know, actually try to uh, insist and, 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 uh, and make it work. But um, it, it certainly was true that it, the markets in the scenes that we're, we were seeing on TV those days, during those days, uh, those experimental days, yeah, I, I, many of the vendors are women, if not most. So there was a presence of many women, women working in the grocery stores and yeah, on public transportation getting to those jobs. So yeah, it, uh, it's undoubtedly reduced some density. And I think it also had a pretty beneficial effect. I mean, I was certainly hearing about a lot of men that were quite willing to do the family's shopping in, with certain complaints about how they were probably not making the best use of the budget for food for that day and women might have been more the better the more efficient more wiser purchasers of supplies but in I think it was not so much the patriarchal customs won out in the population but patriarchal notions of <laughs> what should happen one out at the highest levels of government. And they backtracked. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Janine. So um, Kim asked a question about, um, and it relates to Nancy's comments that care work are under, care workers are undervalued, but they're also um, underprotected. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Kim raised the issue of Warren's uh, policy, proposed policy. So I'm going to turn to Nancy Fulbray um, uh, to get your responses on, uh, on that and any thoughts on time use data. Yeah, I think uh, Kim is, is spot on by highlighting the, the Kano Warren legislation. And I, I don't know if we can summon the political will, but we have to try as hard as we can. Uh, to do it and just publicizing it, I think, uh, uh, is a is a really great thing to do. Uh, it it should be, uh, an, you know, it, it should be an international initiative, really. Um, about um, vulnerability of low income households, I, I sort of suspect that vulnerability does uh, is gr greater in low income households, but I don't think we know, and that's one of the reasons why we need a better sense of the you know, kind of the multidimensional factors that are affecting living standards and also states of mind in, uh, you know, uh, mental health in, in households. Um, uh, and, and specifically to respond to Erica, I think, you know, my, my suggestion is for us to develop a web-based survey uh, that's anonymized and that, um, is basically publicized on social media, but is also recruits people who are interested to go out and help administer it uh, to people who are not online. Um, possibly combining it with sort of qualitative research to kind of calibrate the results of the survey. So uh, I, I do have some models of, uh, of web-based surveys like that that I could send you. Um, they're all in process. It's all unfolding. One of the big obstacles is getting, uh, in the U.S. at least, is getting um, review board permission for work with human subjects. So the regulatory bureaucracy is is really um, constraining effort to to field these uh, really quickly. But I I think there are a variety of ways to um, uh, develop some kind of web-based uh, survey, and there are some good models out there. Great, and I'm just going to turn back to, to, to Nyla. Nyla, do you have any thoughts on the issues raised in this round of questions? Are you there? Okay. Nyla. Now you're okay. Yes. We can hear you now. We thought we could hear you now. <laughs> Are yes, you... we should. Just a second, Nyla. 
G, do you know Just what? Just one second. Yeah, I, uh, Zoom seems to want to keep muting Nyla. <laughs> be something very important. One second, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what's happening. One second. No, maybe we can um, go to the next question and let me figure this out and then Nyla can comment right afterwards. Okay, we're gonna hold off. Uh, so collect your comments, Nyla, we'll come back to you um, once we figure out what's going on, okay? Okay, uh, next round of, of, of questions. Go ahead, G. Okay, so the next question is gonna come from Pei Chen Cheng um, and you can go ahead, Pei Chen, in just one second. And, and hello, and thank, thank you very much. And can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the panel. I have really learned a lot. And I'm from Taiwan, and I have a sh really short question. And I'm interested in how can we take care of the elder woman in this situation, and what role should the government play on the issue of isolated elders in local level? Because like, um, for example, we can give more power to the community care centers where the elders usually go and give them the power to decide which group of residents should be cared for first, or we should ask the government to take up more responsibility to redistribute resources in this kind of really um, emergence situation. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, G. Yes, the next question will be from Maga Alawadi. Um, Maga, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to keep it short, but thank you so much. This is inspiring in some way. So um, I'm currently based in Hamburg, Germany, but most of my work has been developed in Brazil. And one of the things that uh, Janine was mentioning, I was a child when the cholera epidemic uh, hit Argentina. And one of the main things, so those memories are coming back in Argentina and in Brazil. And one of the main thing is that uh, the aggressive campaign conducted by the government of how to take care of uh, you know, drinking water and cooking correctly certain things, it was uh, mom's responsibility it was women's responsibility in the household, right? So uh, cooking properly and taking care of the water and uh, teaching how to wash your hands, it was mom's responsibility. Uh, so in a certain way, dealing with this inside the household, right, in the, in the domestic sphere was uh, women's responsibility compared to men. And now that we are trying to understand what is going on in Brazil, it happens again that certain measures regarding the, the health of the kids are the responsibility of the mothers. And in a certain way, this opening a path to, to understand why uh, women are preferring, right, quote and unquote, informal working relations because they need to stay at, at home and public opinion is putting them in the, in the middle of the discussion or, uh, well, you cannot go outside with the kids or how you're handling like, uh, you know, grocery shopping or certain things. So this is a new responsibility that for some of us, uh, it's a memory during this cholera epidemic, but it's coming back and it's again another burden on the domestic sphere upon women. So I would really like uh, to hear about that. Any comments or thoughts? Great, thank you. And our third question, G. Yes, I am going to call on Manuel Garcia next. Uh, Manuel, you, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Hello, thank you for, for the panel. This was very, very, very interesting. I wanted to ask the panelists about sort of one of the consequences of, of, of this pandemic. A lot of people have been saying, well, you know, the back to normal will never exist. This will change things, you know, permanently. And one of the th things that they've been mentioned a lot is the, you know, the, the new relevance of remote work, which is something that we've been seeing for a long time, but now it seems to be uh, more underlined by this situation. Um, in that sense, now we are seeing that sort of like 
all paid work is, is, is starting to take place in the same place than unpaid labor. So what do you think are the consequences for the patriarchal division of labor in the household now that we are back in the situation where paid and unpaid work take place in the same location? Great, thank you so much. So um, we're going to return to the panel and I think Nyla now has full control over her microphone. So I'm gonna start with, with Nyla uh, to um, either respond to some of the previous rounds of questions or, 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 or some of the issues that have been raised uh, right now. So uh, over to you, Nyla. Well, I'd like to go back to that Warren bill because I think, um, I think we'll be watching quite closely because uh, you know, I think one thing that this whole pandemic has revealed is the vulnerability of so many of the essential workers. Uh, but I, it seems to be geared very much to the health professionals because it's talking about protective equipment, etc. And I hope at some stage, and I want that goes to my second point, is whether there is now sufficient public opinion for much greater public investment in you know, in the rights of all the essential workers and and uh, you know care workers, even those on the on the at the field level, the front line that people were talking about. So, you know, one of the things that happened after the Second World War, you know, is that we got the National Health Service, even though Churchill had dominated the you know the Second World War. And so, I think people are hoping that when we come out of this crisis, that there will be a strong enough movement of public opinion to really rethink our priorities and i you know the thing about nationalizing essential services is i think something that i would really like to see happen because it's it's too, it's too valuable to just leave it to market forces i thought the, uh, and then just coming to this round of questions i thought the question about going back to normal um i'd be very interested to see whether the potential for paid and unpaid work happening in the same space might not be what one would need to push towards a fairer distribution of labor of unpaid work. Uh, I think that's an optimistic scenario, but I think it's a, it's a possible scenario, you know, in the sense that people are much more aware of one person taking on a disproportionate amount of it. The other thing I think might come out of this is that We've become aware that it is so it is so possible to do quite a lot of our work without having to travel to a different place. And so in the interests of the environment and of traffic and so on, I wonder if there may or may not also be a movement towards more home-based work where there, where it is possible and, and not where it is not. Great, uh, th thank you so much. Um, and so um, one question that was raised in this round um, is thinking about elder care um, and care mm -hmm. for elderly women in, in particular. So um, I'm gonna turn to Nancy uh, to see if she has any thoughts on that or any of the other issues that have been raised about uh, paid and unpaid uh, uh, work. Great, the elderly women, elder care issue I think is, really has to focus on overcoming that that dichotomy more government assistance versus more home and community based care somehow we have to reconcile these two and i think there there's some very good models of this in some states within the us that have basically dismantled nursing homes and put their emphasis on better pay and working conditions for home care workers uh, i don't mean to imply that it's easy to do this i think there are a lot of institutional details um, that that have to be in funding mechanisms that have to be addressed. But I do think that's uh, uh, the model that, that we should be kind of reaching for. Um, I do think there is a danger uh, here uh, in, the, in the care crisis that uh, women, gender roles are gonna end up being re reinforced. That's always been the contradiction that one of the reasons women are are have less bargaining powers they voluntarily do a lot of care work but they can't really threaten to withdraw that care work without causing enormous pain and suffering to people who really need to be cared for so you know that's sort of the essence of the of the of the of the contradiction of of care 
And I, I do think we have an opportunity to renegotiate it culturally. And I think that is, that is going on, uh, that people are saying, look, people are, uh, this is a really um, uh, important labor activity. We depend on it. There are similarities between frontline workers uh, are doing and uh, in the labor market and the home. And we really need to build on that, on that opportunity. And I tend to agree with Nyla about the uh, remote work. I mean, it could go either way. I can see how it could reinforce the gender division of labor in some ways. But anything that kind of disrupts habits and inertial, um, inertial institutions and expectations, I think, gives women some space to bargain, uh, to negotiate for a more egalitarian uh, division of labor. And, and uh, you know, regardless of whatever predictions we might make, I think that's what we need to really push for. Great, uh, thanks so much. So um, uh, MAGA had had, uh, refer had the presentation by Janine reminded her of the cholera response and in terms of it, you know, thinking about the front lines of care being women's responsibility, um, not just in general, but in uh, responding to these types of uh, uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, including with COVID. So, and that uh, this you know, might restrict their choices in terms of unpaid work. So kind of the booming demands uh, on, on uh, uh, time, women's time for care work, restricting their um, ability to do um, uh, paid work uh, in, in ways that where they're forced into informal uh, uh, activities and so on. So I'm going in, how does that affect uh, household dynamics in these type of developing countries? So I just want to turn to Janine and see if you had any thoughts on, additional thoughts on, on that. I think that, that we should focus very carefully on homeschooling. And part of social distancing and part of the, the, the lockdowns has to do with closing schools. And now all of the arrangements that different governments are making to do what can be done in, in terms of distance learning with homework being, or parents working alongside their children at home. And under conditions where a father may be better educated than uh, in formal terms than a mother, now, one would really like to know how much of this, the, the activity of homeschooling, accompanying children in, 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 this, in this new modality for learning, how much of that is actually being taken over by fathers, who furthermore must be getting pretty bored sitting around at home and watching the activities go forward without any role. And we do know, I mean, what have men's, uh, in the contributions to household labor been in the past, the repairs, the repairs of the, the washing machine or whatever, and, uh, and uh, some supervision of schoolwork. So at least there's a ray of hope there that there may be uh, a very kind of natural and legitimated role, even prestigious role for men to take on in childcare during these times. Great, thanks so much. So I think we have time for one more round of questions. Um, so GE, back to you. Yes, great. So our next question will be from uh, Marina Gerano. Marina, you can go ahead. Hello, yeah, um, I wanted to get a sense from all of the panelists what their thinking was um, in terms of like what scenarios are playing in their head on what post-19, COVID-19 would look like? Like, how do we begin? I mean, what would, what are the steps to, towards going back to some kind of new normal? Um, because that's a conversation right now and I want to understand, you know, is there something from feminist perspective that could guide us to, towards a return that would reduce the probability of a second wave? Great, thank you. G, the next question. Uh, next will be Archana Patkar. Archana, you can go ahead in just one second. Oh, go ahead. Thank you very much. That's a, this has been a great panel. I have a kind of methodology question. I'm a development practitioner, an independent advisor, currently working very closely with UNAIDS and WHO 
in several countries in Africa are really focusing on stigma and discrimination within the HIV national responses. And our biggest uh, challenge pre-COVID has always been to really, no matter how great the data, how wonderful the secondary literature, and you know how thorough the information system, it has, there has never been a substitute for going out and really talking to those who are silent and invisible and not at the table to really understand how better uh, programs and policies can serve them, who is left out and why. And these are people not in the grid. These are people without information, without the internet, very rudimentary mobile phones. And you know, these are people with different kinds of disabilities, a whole lot of intersectionalities in there. And if we don't get their voices in, um, replenishment of programs, funding is going to continue um, without the voices and the real needs and demands of these people coming in. And, you know, that world is continuing. We are currently <laughs> continuing um, progr program funding proposals for several countries. And we don't know how to go out there and get their voices and their views. Um, so it's really a question on how do we do this remotely? What is a substitute for this kind of face-to-face um, -face consultation? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so G, our last question. Uh, the last question will be from uh, Claudia. I'll just unmute you. You can go ahead. Right, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, all right, okay. Uh, my question is to no one in particular, all of you, anyone would like to answer. Um, we've been seeing a lot of articles about, you know, how domestic violence is going up in times of containment. And also quite a few articles, uh, particularly in the comments that you get on, you know, um, social network. That one of the explanation why violence is, um, uh, is uh, getting up in, in, in household is because men cannot have access to prostitutes anymore. Uh, and therefore, you know, so how do we actually use this time to also fight that kind of myth? Um, and, and we can also see a lot of discussion about how pornography has to be made available in a wider way, more accessible way on the net. Um, so that, you know, it's a, some kind of escapism for men who might otherwise become more violent. Um, and on prostitution too. Why they're uh, watching porn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we've even had um, conversations at government level. We've had uh, conversation at government level that making pornography more accessible might be a way of cutting down on domestic violence. Um, and also, we hear a lot of talks about you know sex workers uh, actually saying that well, they're becoming more like social workers because men talk to them, call them to have a chat. It's not about sex anymore; it's about chat. So there's also a whole possibility of actually cutting short any kind of position that is on abolition of prostitution if prostitution becomes social work. So, I mean, I have a lot of questions around all these issues. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to do, because we're almost out of time, is I'm going to return to the panel. I'm going to go in the order of the presentations and just ask the panelists, you have one minute each to respond to any of these final issues uh, that, 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 that have come up. You know, what is the new normal? Um, you know, methodology, how do we get the voices of the people that are marginalized and vulnerable heard? Or, you know, this complex issue between um, uh, gender-based violence, domestic uh, violence, um, and, um, and, and sex work, um, and, and sex. So um, back to the panels, I'll start with Nancy. Okay, in response to Marina, um, first, um, we really have to increase healthcare, improve healthcare everywhere. Secondly, we need to really uh, uh, strengthen the social safety net. Uh, third, we have to figure out a way to finance that. It can't, there's a limit to the amount of debt that we can incur to do it. I think we need a wealth tax, ideally a global wealth tax, um, to help uh, achieve those first two goals. And then I think there are a bunch of policies that people have converged on as a means of transition, which is to 
extend testing, uh, to do contact tracing, to have more differential sequestration that's tailored uh, on a kind of a local level to uh, particular circumstances. Um, I think bringing in, I'll just say quickly, I think bringing in sexuality and pornography is a really, is really important. It's not something I know a lot about, but I, I really think it, it needs to be brought front and center. Great, great. Thank you so much, Nancy. Nyla. Uh, well, I agree with some of with what, what Nancy said uh, about what, where we invest. And I think, you know, the idea of having a, a, a fairly universal safety net is something that we really have to take very seriously and that it should be made up of services, access to essential services. I also think one of the things that has come out of this crisis is the more enlightened and visionary leadership. A, a lot of it is by, has been by women, uh, but we have had you know, a number of men. And I wonder if you know, going into the post-COVID era, whether we cannot build alliances around that kind of leadership. How do we build that kind of visionary leadership? And the third one about domestic violence and pornography, you know, I don't know what the evidence is, but what I do know is under situations of stress, economic insecurity and so on, violence goes up. And it's, it has not been shown particularly to be linked to, you know, pornography and sexuality. Maybe there's a cause. I haven't seen it. Great. Thank you so much, Nyla. Janine. I would hope that in the post-COVID-19 era in Peru and in many other countries, many Latin American countries maybe, that, that somehow felt that they had you know, poverty here on the run, I think that this experience has shown us that vulnerability was still very, very much with us and that in the, the lines of poverty need to be redrawn to take into account you know, the the scarce reserves that households have and the the need for rethinking social programs and uh, you know, uh, ways of functioning of Peruvian society and the Peruvian economy. Um, I I wish we had more time to talk about the issue of violence. It it is very present violence. It is very much in this whole that basket of, of topics that we want to address. I guess I, I wonder whether we, we're we working from a, a kind of tension buildup theory of violence or a more performative theory of male violence where if you break up the drinking groups on Saturday night and you sort of you know, disconnect those, those conversations of men with other men about how dominant they can be in their lives and their households. Maybe the, you know, the, the effects of social distancing might not be quite as imagined, but it remains to be seen. I, I'll leave it there, we're out of time. Great, thanks so much. And so um, I'm going to have to close this, this webinar. Um, I realize that there's a number of people, a number of questions, um, people wanting to ask questions that we didn't get to. Um, but uh, we are, this is just the first in a long series of conversations. And IAFI is hoping to facilitate, you know, a whole bunch of different online interactions, um, whether it's this type of panel, webinar type of uh, uh, format, whether it's just helping people share their experiences um, in different countries around the world. We're going to pursue a bunch of online programming and events like this. So um, in closing, I just wanted to let you know that we're going to distribute uh, the links to, to the recording of this webinar uh, so you can make it available to people who cannot join us uh, today. I uh, will also uh, let you know more about the special issue of feminist economics um, in terms of the special issue that's focused on, on COVID-19. Um, we'll keep you posted of future events like this. I think this went really well. Um, and as I said, we're going to keep um, um, programming, doing events like this 
um, in, in, in the future. Any feedback that you have for us, uh, please um, uh, let us know. And in all of that, we'll also, for those of you who uh, don't know IAFI very well, we'll give you some information, let you know where you can get information uh, about the International Association for Feminist Economics. So once again, I want to thank our three panelists um, for just a very interesting and engaging uh, session um, and look for more of this to come. So thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.